In this segment of the Employee Data Webinar, we'll review how to use the Check-In Workstation to have employees check themselves in and out and have those times populate onto their time card. Before you get started, one thing that you'll probably want to do is go to Configuration and set the rounding rules that you want for your employee time cards. So I'm going to go over to Home, Configuration, System, At Locations and Users, At the Region, I'm going to double click, I'd go here and go to Set Options. If you have multiple schools, you might want different options for different schools, but whenever possible, try to set things at the region. I'm going to go to Set Options. We're talking about employee data. We'll talk about these other things in the Configuration section. Right now, I'm going to scroll down for Time Card Options. Here is where I'm going to set my rounding. It's currently set to closest none, which means exact time. Let's say I wanted to set it to the nearest 15 minutes. I click on the plus. The minute interval is going to be 15. This is for the clock in. I would probably want to do the same thing for the rounding clock out. Minute interval, 15, and save. So now, if somebody clocks in at 5 minutes to 8, they get rounded up to 8. If they sign in at 4.50, it would round back to 4.45, the nearest 15-minute interval. You do have the ability to restrict check-in and out to schedule. If you are interested in that, type in Schedule Adherence in ProCareSupport.com, and you'll get an article on that. Most people choose not to do that. So that's the first thing you'd want to set up. And in terms of employees, what you really need is three elements. The employee needs to be employed. So under work history, they need to be employed. That's the absolute minimum. I'd also strongly recommend that you give the employee under the Information and Relationship screen, give them a default work area so they don't have to constantly pick from a list that long or longer. This way, this will be their default. If they want to check into a different room, they can. And the last thing I'd recommend is under the pay rate, whether or not you're paying them through ProCare, I would at least put in the hourly pay code that they will sign in as so that every time they check in, they don't have that big list to pick from. And all of that would be different selections that your payroll person would then wonder why are they signing in as owner one day and teacher the next. So in order to use check-in, we need to generate a temporary registration code. And the whole reason for it is this. You've got a check-in workstation. It does not know who is in front of that computer and is putting in fingerprints or codes. So the temporary registration number is just a one-time use that the employee is going to put in so that the check-in station knows who's standing in front of it. There are two ways to generate the temporary registration numbers. One of them as a one-off for just one individual is you can come up here to Information and Relationships and click on New Register. That would be their code. Mary Anderson is going to use this one time and she will never need this code again. And the code will also expire after a number of days and you just generate more codes if you ever needed them. So this is a one-off registration. If you want to issue codes to all of your employees, because you're going to be starting to use the check-in station for everybody, go to Functions, Temporary Registration. It tells you it will generate codes for employees who are not yet registered. So you could run this every day. It's not going to erase the codes for the people who have already registered. This is just for the ones who don't. Do you want to create the codes? Yes. And then it tells you where the report is, Employee Data Registration Temporary. So let's go there. And I'm going to go to Reports, Standard Reports, Employee Data, Registration, Temporary. There's no date or anything to pick. You're just going to run it. And here we see Mary Anderson. That's the same number that we had just generated for her. And I'm also going to do one other person here because I'm going to go through a couple of examples. And we're also going to write down the code for Amy Collins. So now that I've got my codes, we're going to go over to the check-in workstation. 
But I'm going to make a small difference between Mary and Amy because some of you will have this. I'm going to make Mary Anderson not only an employee, but in family data and accounting, I'm going to make her a pickup person, let's say for just Peter Adams. So I'm going to go to Peter's relationship box and I'm going to add an existing person, that being Mary Anderson. We'll find her. Here's Mary. I'm going to select her. I could give her a relationship. The critical thing is I'm also going to flag her as a pickup person. Save and exit. This would be the identical thing as if she had been up here as a payer. The bottom line is she is a pickup person for Peter Adams. So she has a dual role, and we'll go through that in a minute. Now we'll go over to the check-in workstation to go through the one-time configuration on it and show you how they're going to use the temporary registration numbers. So on your desktop, if you've installed check-in on it, you're going to see the penguin with the green check mark over its head. When you double-click on it, you're going to come on this screen. And now we're going to the first time registration for an employee. They are not going to click on start the first time. The first time only, they're going to click on register. They're going to enter the code that you gave them, that one-time registration for that one person. So I'm going to start with Amy Collins. I'm going to do her with just the numbers for an ID and not a fingerprint. So she gets her temporary code, which you've told her. She will not need that code ever again because she will have been registered. Welcome, Amy. This is currently the prompt for the fingerprint reader. If you're not using the fingerprint reader, you will land on this screen directly. You'll need to enter two different numbers, a person ID and a password. The numbers cannot be sequential, like 1234, or repetitive, like 3333. So next, I'm going to enter a four-digit person ID for her. And I'm going to enter a password for her. They have to be different. The reason both a PIN and a password are used is for security. It's similar to logging into any system that requires a username and password. The cross-check of a PIN plus a password ensures a secure check-in by that authorized person only. I'm going to enter. She is done with the registration process. She will not click on register again. I'm going to immediately go through registration again for Mary Anderson with the fingerprint reader. So if you've got a fingerprint reader, she'll click on register. She will enter the number. Welcome, Mary. It's going to prompt her for four samples of a fingerprint and then one confirmation so that it makes sure that the number it conjures up for her fingerprint is consistent. I'm now putting my finger down on the fingerprint reader. I have my four samples. It's going to now want one more to cross-check that the samples, in fact, are consistent. So if I am Mary Anderson, I am now done with the registration process. Either of those two teachers going forward are going to be doing the following. They're going to click on Start. And let's say I'm the person who was Amy. I'm using numbers. Again, if I'm using numbers, you won't see this screen. You'll land on this screen. And she would put in her two codes that we just did, the person ID and the password. And this is Amy's screen. She is currently checked out. She will be checked in. We locked her pay code down as office. And her work area is also office. She could pick a different work area, but not a different pay code. Select. She will be checked into office. She has been checked in. For Mary Anderson, we'll go through this process again, but just with a fingerprint. And remember, she's the person in that dual role. So I'm going to click Start, putting the fingerprint down for Mary Anderson. And she gets two things to do. She can be the authorized pickup or the employee. It doesn't matter whether she checks herself or the child in or out first. We're going to do the child, authorized pickup. Peter Adams is checked out. She simply checks him in just like she would a parent. She click on there. She'll get returned back to that screen. And then as an employee, she can come in. Same thing as we did before. She has a default 
classroom. She's got one pay code. She can select and finish. At the end of the day, it's basically the opposite. She's going to come back in, click start, enter either the fingerprint or her codes, and she can check the child back out again or herself. She could also transfer, by the way, over to a different room if you wanted that, and she can click finish. So the reason she got this message is she never selected anything to do. I'm going to click on cancel, click on here so that we're actually accomplishing something, and click finish. She's now checked in and out. So let's go over to the two time cards and see what we accomplished. For Mary Anderson, you can see that she checked herself in and out. I could double click on those letters and I can see who she is. I happen to have a photo entered for her. You'll see that these other times were entered by the director. If I make a change in here right now, the initials would change to the person I am currently checked in as. Amy Collins would have exactly the same thing happening. Now we're going to go over to Peter and take a look at his time card. Here's Peter. And here you can see that Mary Anderson had checked him in and out. The only other thing you might want to do with employee data is the same as you would with the child's time card, which is if you go to an employee and let's say somebody hadn't completed their time, you can go ahead and you can enter a time, you could edit it, you could delete the line, and you'll notice again that the initials have changed.